exhausting, but at the same time, it's stretching us in different ways. So I'm looking forward to listening to Father Eric. As you can see, it's going to be recorded. <laughs> and we will be able to have that as well as a resource. And he's going to be sharing that. So <laughs> I hope you all enjoy and ask questions as well. So please, Father. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. It's always my pleasure uh, to come here and talk to you all. And um, I don't know about you, but perhaps... Sorry? No, it's okay. It was the camera that turned off, but it's fine. No, no, it's supposed to turn off. So, um, well, it's supposed to turn off. It's supposed to go on sleep mode. But... Um, um, so I know that perhaps uh, these days, uh, with I see you all there with the masks, and it's uh, quite heartwarming to see the little girls with the masks and the little uh, cute, uh, you know, tiger faces or or whatever faces they have there on those masks of little uh, bunny rabbits and so forth. Um, that uh, some people have said, get ready for a long and cold and hard winter, <laughs> and uh, it's going to be tough. And uh, it's going to be tough going, and many people are going to die. Many people are going to be uh, uh, tested positive, and there's no assurance of getting a real effective vaccine. And um, all the words are kind of elongated at the end, right, just to make it more dramatic. Right? And, uh, and some people say it's going to take several more years. So hunger down, uh, get ready. Well, uh, you probably know that uh, in front of all this sort of dire, these dire predictions and a lot of pessimism that we sometimes hear from different quarters, I mean, different sources, um, it's sometimes good to go to history and see what happened in World War I, or at the end of World War I, which in and of itself is already a pretty traumatic situation that had uh, impassioned all of Europe, so many, uh, inflamed it. Europe, rather, with so many passions. What followed World War One was the influenza pandemic, also called the Spanish flu. It depends on where you were from. Some people call it the Spanish flu, other people call it the French flu, but whatever. But, uh, but uh, between 20 and 40 million people died, right? And it was very, it was very uh, sudden. Like people would go and play bridge at home, and then somebody would get ill that evening, and bang, they would die that evening, right? It was. Uh, it was uh, a very, very devastating uh, pandemic, and it is said one of the worst uh, in uh, world recorded history, the Black Death also in the 14th century. It was quite a, a, a global disaster. So, so what should be our attitude when we hear stories that have happened in the past and that we have indeed recuperated from those or, or at least bounced back to a certain degree? Uh, what what really should be our attitude? Well, perhaps we get recourse to a famous uh, 17th century um, Carmelite monk from Lorraine in France. His name was Brother Lawrence. He wrote a treatise on the presence of God, and he came from a, a very, very poor, poor, poor family. And uh, he he was uh, about uh, you know 18 uh, years old when he had a a massive uh, conversion, you could say God's grace just like fell upon him. And it was in that winter that there was a tremendous, tremendous uh, winter, basically. As he walked outside, he saw that all the trees were stripped of their leaves. And he, he saw that everything was dead. Nothing was alive. The trees were all barren. But then he, he received the grace, like that. He came out unconverted, and he saw everything dead, no, no leaves. And then the idea struck him like, like a powerful thunderbolt that just within a few months, those dead trees would be in bloom again, right? Would be full of leaves and flowers and fruits would appear and everywhere, right? And he didn't see that, like he didn't actually see those leaves or, or those fruit. But he knew it would happen, right? And so uh, he received at that moment a powerful sense of God's providence and God's power. 
um, a power or, or a sense that never was never effaced or never erased from his uh, his soul, and it enkindled within him such a, a powerful powerful sense of God's providence and therefore of God's love. Uh, that it just increased, it just increased as the years went on and he was able to help many people with that sense of God's providence even though at times the tree looks quite devastatingly uh, empty and, and so now as we're facing the empty tree that is the pandemic we have to think, you know, you know how they talk about PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress so there's been a trauma, and then you're left with stress after the trauma. But Viktor Frankl also spoke about post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth, PTS, uh, no PTS, no PTG. It's PTG. That's what we have to have. Post-traumatic growth. Right. So that's an invitation that we all have now to truly grow, and the way we can really grow, and this is what I invite you to do, but it's an act that you all have to do freely, I can't do it for you, each one of us has to do it on their own, is the, the, the decision to always be an optimist. The decision of always being an optimist, a grounded optimist, which is what, which means what? It's the genuine belief, not the faith, but the genuine belief that anything that happens to us, good things and bad things, can indeed make us better. And this pandemic and all the situations, and this can be applied to situations in your family, this can be applied to situations in your marriage, in your health, these things can make us better. And that's why they can end up with, from a tree that is empty of leaves, to a beautiful tree lush with fruits and beauty that people can, can pick from. That's the beauty of that tree. People can pick the fruits from the tree. And people must pick the fruits from your tree. And ultimately, we could say, and this, is, this uh, ties into the whole purpose of, of Hawthorne, is that the very purpose of Hawthorne is that people can pick from this tree. And that way, we can be uh, truly of service. And so, Somehow, and this is what we ask, is that the, whatever good things happen, whatever bad things happen, will lead us to be better. And if something really bad happens to us, it can also lead to greater empathy. Greater empathy. Empathy is a great good. Empathy is an understanding or a, a, a sense of connection with those who have suffered. It's, it's a, it's a very distasteful thing to see somebody who just has no empathy. It, it just, just doesn't care if you suffer in some way. But it's a very beautiful thing to see somebody who does have empathy. I heard the story of a guy uh, who, uh, his name is Andy Grammer, he's a, he's a musician and he is an indomitable, absolutely indomitable optimist. And he just dedicated his life to making life better for others, but to cheer them in some way. He does it through his music. And the greatest joy of his life is to, well, write a little piece of music that will move hearts. He loves it especially when a lot of people start singing together, you know, when they, they sing like this and, you know, like that. And he just, like, totally gets, gets into that. But it started, I mean, that, that was his career as a musician, right? But it started by by pain. It started by his own suffering, his own pain that he experienced. And that was when he was something like 20 years old, he lost his mother. She passed away, I believe it was of cancer, and it was a great uh, moment of, of, of tragedy for him. And it really affected him, but he said, wait a minute, I have to be an indomitable, indomitable optimist. I have to allow this to make me better. Right? So this will not make me worse. So, as an example of a concrete thing that he did, and also, I mean, he, he recounts how much he learned from his mother, but he was, a, I don't know, a few months later, sitting in a Starbucks, and uh, he saw a couple there, an elderly, somewhat elderly couple, not super old, but somewhat elderly, 
And the, the, the lady there reminded him of his mother. It's the way she looked and the way she moved. And uh, so, so he, he thought, oh, look, that looks like my mom. And he felt, he felt, I don't know, he felt touched. There, there's mom. But he said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. So he went up to this, these strangers who he didn't know, and he says, uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you, you look lovely, and you remind me of my mom, who I passed away a few months ago. <laughs> and the lady uh, turned to him, and she said, I just lost my son a few months ago. You know? and, uh, and then, of course, they, they both started crying. And they both, yeah. So, you know, uh, he could have just uh, left it at that. He could have left it at a, at a nice thought that he had at a distance while he was having his coffee. But his sense of, of, uh, of wanting to serve led to that. And they became great friends and so forth. Just by seeing somebody there, you know, in the, in, in the, in the Starbucks. And this became, you could say, it, the, you know, the cause of his life, right? To, to, and he did it, of course, in his case, through music. To allow optimism to surge, to, to become almost a contagion right, to those around us. And, um, and so, a lot of people are asking today, you know, why would God allow this pandemic? Why would he allow somebody, however many thousands of people have died so far or been diagnosed, why would God allow this? And, well, if we look at the tradition, uh, the Christian tradition, like St. Augustine and St. Thomas, uh, we know God is not the cause of evil, but he always allows it to bring, around, to bring about uh, greater good. And this is the most reasonable uh, explanation. Even though it's true, it doesn't always leave people to totally satisfied. The idea that God can not cause, does not cause evil, but he allows good to, to come out of it, nevertheless, is not always satisfying for people, right? even though uh, it, is, uh, it is true. And that is why um, we have to uh, allow our Lord, let, let, allow God to allow these things that happen in our life, from the daily small, annoying things, to the bigger principles, uh, to give us greater meaning in life. I can become a better person, and I will acquire uh, qualities, my marriage will acquire better, way greater qualities, even my children, that they, they would never have tried to acquire had I not experienced this Let's call it that, this evil, this bad thing. I will become more resilient. I will learn from this. I will re-emphasize the real importance of meaning in my life. And when we have meaning, we have true joy. That's a little bit, you could say, how we begin to forge this optimism. Because optimism is a form of joy. But true joy, it's not in and having nice things, uh, we know that. We, we are not satisfied by nice physical things, pleasurable things. It has to somehow come uh, in, uh, in terms of meaning. I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, one author who, uh, well, for me, uh, studying art history, I, I always found an interesting author, even though a lot of his ideas are, I are not really, uh, don't really share a lot of his ideas. Walt Whitman, who's a 19th century uh, American poet, essayist, journalist, uh, who, who uh, well, 19th century, 1889, 18, 1819 to 1890s, and, uh, and, you know, he did all kinds of things, uh, a bit of a strange guy, kind of a deus, uh, you know, a bit odd ideas, but in 1873, at the age of 53, so that's three years, that's four years younger than me right now, but uh, he had this severely uh, debilitating stroke. He was just like, uh, and I, I don't know what a stroke exactly does to you, but uh, he had he entered uh, into a period of his life that was particularly dark, and uh, he describes it uh, as being kind of exiled from his own body, a cascade, in fact, of exiles, and uh, because all the things he loved had now changed. He had this difficulty with his body, he couldn't move, he, I mean, he literally couldn't breathe properly, he, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't even lift up a fork, you know, I mean, uh, to eat, so he, everything was done for him, 
And, um, and so then not only that, but he had to move from his home in Washington. He had to go and move in with his brother in New Jersey. And uh, uh, he had been a, a volunteer nurse uh, after the Civil War, or during the Civil War. And, um, and that's where he first taught about the connection between the, the spirit, the body and the spirit. But now he was kind of like totally stuck with this, well, with this, um, this stroke that he had. But having accepted all these things that happened to him with the stroke and the change of venues, the change of place, no longer doing all these things, he started bit by bit, you could say, to recuperate. And um, he and he said that he attributed his, well, not perfect health, but his improving health uh, to being daily in the open air, in nature, underneath the stars. And he wrote beautiful poems about the stars and, and how this has this healing effect, right? And, uh, and he began, which he probably would not have done before, just to really think about the elemental uh, questions of existence, really what makes life worth living? Or what is truly the meaning of life? What makes life worth remembering? And he realizes that he has to acknowledge his own weakness, and, uh, and, he, and he begins to, uh, uh, to take a, give a lot of importance to his friends, to the affection of his relatives, and so forth. And uh, he, he began to find a lot of meaning in the, just the perennial um, endurance of nature around him, uh, the open air, the fields, the trees, the changes of season. He became very connected with the very seasons, the sun, the stars, the heavens around. He, he wasn't like a Christian in the strict sense, but but there was a change largely due to that, well, that debilitating weakness. The same thing happened also to another personality who's much more well known as Leo Tolstoy. It was about the same period, 1828 to 1910, who, as you may know, at the age of 50, uh, he had written War and Peace, he had written Anna Karenina, and he was like a super successful writer uh, he had this amazing wife, Sonia, who had borne him 14 children, right? And, uh, and suddenly, well, he didn't have a stroke, but he went into a kind of a, a depression. And uh, he, he just literally saw no longer any meaning to life. Literally saw no meaning to life. And, and he had all kinds of suicidal thoughts. And, uh, and then so that's where he decided to write these very candid confessions, I think it's what it's called, his book in one of the later books called Confessions. Um, and uh, it's just like a memoir of the, you know, with great emotional intensity and candor, you know, uh, about all that he had received, the money, the fame, and, and that he actually had been writing for the wrong reasons. That he'd been writing and doing all that stuff for success and, and all these things now, uh, we're kind of falling apart. I mean, I mean, this is a guy who at this point now, with all that success, and just think about a successful person that is esteemed, he didn't want to go out into the, into the forest with a, with a rifle to go hunting because he was afraid he would just kill himself, right? I mean, that's how, that's how despondent he became, right? And, and so um, he, he began to reflect more deeply about the meaning of life, and he writes about it in, the, in these confessions, right? And at first he thought, well, maybe the meaning of life is uh, science and uh, as the ultimate cause. Maybe it's about Epicureanism, you're just, just having real pleasure all the time, right? And he, could, he, just, like, he, was, like, he was just grasping and, and finally said, well, you know what the meaning of life is? To kill myself. That's the meaning of life. And he almost, he almost did it, right? And then uh, he said he held on. To, as he was thinking about doing that, he held on to this vague doubt, this vague doubt that maybe he was wrong. That maybe he was wrong. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't kill myself, right? Maybe life is meaningful, right? And he didn't hunger down on the, on the absolute conviction that he had, uh, for at least for a while, that my life was meaning, meaningless, right? And, uh, or that there was nothing greater than science or reason. Or even he held for a life that a life of hedonism was the only way to go. But bit by bit, those things started to well, they started to um, wither away, 
and he made, he made a deep act of um, humility of acknowledging his own ignorance about the meaning of life and he started to develop a great esteem for just ordinary folk, ordinary people, the people who labored the land, right? Not the intelligentsia who were turned, telling him all kinds of things that he had gotten to know, and uh, not the Epicureans, those people who were, you know, who knew how to know, have a nice uh, glass of champagne, uh, uh, but he, he saw the simple folk, and he was, he was struck how those people who were, had suffered who were uh, often struck with a lot of privations, actually had a deep sense of meaning of life. And this is what led, led him to the foundation of faith. And uh, even though it wasn't particularly well articulated, at least from a rational point of view, right? But he saw now faith was the foundation and he embraced that. And, uh, and he, well, he talks about it in a beautiful way, really, right? That the, that the meaning of his life ultimately fell uh, to his faith, right? So, and, and this allowed him to stand up again to, to see a, a true meaning of his life. And, uh, and uh, he gave a lot of thanks for that. He saw that God had, had truly helped him, right? And it, it reminds us uh, of that passage of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 13, of the woman who is healed of her infirmity. Remember the story of the lady who is like crouched over, she's got, she's got a bad back, she's like this. And, um, and so Luke tells us she's been like that for 18 years. You all remember that, 18 years? And uh, she was hunched over. And if she's hunched over, she could not look far away. She was always just looking down at the ground, right? And uh, meaning she had a very earthbound vision, an earthbound vision. And so when we get a little bit down, when we get hunched over, we end up looking down at the ground and we're just very earthbound, right? And, um, uh, and this is the case when we have a kind of a chronic condition of sign, a, cr a kind, uh, a lack of imagination, a certain pessimism, a certain tendency towards uh, complaining, and it could go on for 18 years, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, the Lord straightened her up instantaneously. He gave her that marvelous grace. And um, of course, had she, had she not had at least some hope, even though she was crouched down, she would not have been able even to come to him. She would not have been able to, to be healed by him, right? And so, so that's why the Lord lifted her up and now she could see all the realities of the world just like Walt Whitman saw the beauties of nature and the meaning of just the, you know, the seasons and the stars and, and, and nature and Leo Tolstoy saw the meaning of faith and how faith had, you could say, made him stand up. That's what our Lord, say. Let our Lord said to this woman. He said to her, um, uh, straighten up, you know, uh, straighten up. Don't be crouched over. And well, looking ourselves, also looking at this woman now, we should see in what way in my life now must I straighten up? In my marriage, in the way I approach work, maybe I lack patience with the children I teach, or maybe I lack patience with other members of the faculty, uh, or maybe I need to be Straightened up somehow, right? Straightened up, and uh, this is what everyone can apply. And uh, it's really ultimately a decision, uh, a decision, a decision to always be uh, optimistic, to be, to see that. Wait a minute, I didn't like this thing that this this young girl did at school, or or, or this faculty member, or my husband, or my daughter, or my son. I didn't like that. That was really bad. That, and, and we get very uh, insistent, and we're probably right. We're probably actually right. right. But we can also decide, I'm going to allow this to make me better. And so one way to do that is through the lens of service, right? the lens of service. Uh, I want to make my life a life of service. And maybe if we can, if we just do that a little bit, find ways in which way can I make my day, my day a, a, an act of service such that they can be little things 
They don't have to be huge, huge, massive acts, but little things that somebody, if you make that act of service, it's to a degree, it may be forgotten and not seen, and that's still an act of service, but maybe to a degree that it will somehow be mentioned. Right? The other day, uh, I, this was a few months ago, I was leaving here at Hawthorne, and uh, I, I, don't know, I had to go home quickly, and uh, I was kind of pressed for time, so I said, I didn't have my coffee, I need my coffee. <laughs> so, so I said, uh, stop, I said, go to stop. I said, okay, go I like went to the drive through and um, you know, they have the thing there, uh, yes, can we help you? Yes, I'll just have a medium latte with a, uh, whatever. And, uh, and I said, should I have a medium? Should I have a large? No, I'll just, I'll just go for a medium. Uh, you, know, you know what, I'll go for a small, because you know, I don't need that. <clears throat> so, so I'm waiting there, right? And there's a, an SUV right in front of me, and it's a lady, she pulls up and, and suddenly jerks to a sudden halt, right? I guess she didn't see me or something, whatever. Right? But I mean, she was miles from. I mean, she was pretty far from hitting me, you know. But and she was like this, right? And, uh, like sort of saying, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." And anyway, she went forward, and uh, anyway, I came, and uh, she goes. The lady says, uh, "Here's your latte, sir. It's been paid for by the lady." <laughs> so, so I said, "Aww," you know, that was nice. Lady, you know, and she just took off, right? So she didn't have to do that. She could have just taken off and said, "Do that, or do my, you know." Do, but she didn't have to do that. She didn't have to do that. But but I'm sure that she might have told that to her family. Maybe she saw me. No, maybe she, I don't know. Even know if she saw me. There was a priest who killed him. I don't know. I don't know if she said that or not. But uh, but uh, so oh, I had to do something. I had to run. <laughs> but I told it at home, I said, oh, there was this lady uh, in a black SUV and blah, 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 blah. And, and so, and now I'm telling you, right? So, so it's like that little act has existed in time and space and in the hearts. And she could, she could have said, you know what? I'm pressing the gas. I'm out of here, right? <laughs> so, and she didn't do that. So, um, and just like the guy in the Starbucks, who hugged and, uh, and wept with the, the lady who we didn't know, but just reminded him of his mother. So uh, it's a decision we have to make. It could have stayed here, but it, it can go out. So it, it's based really on this truth of divine providence that follows us along. And that divine providence means that we should say no to pessimism, no to complaints, yes to optimism. And you know how, you know, some of you had the sleep cycle app, you know, that tells you how well you slept and you can see or you went to bed and you were like this and blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, that was when I had my nightmare and whatever, it goes like that, right? So, well, if we had a sleep cycle for optimism, uh, well, if we had like a graph that would show us, well, one sign that the graph is going down is when we complain, right? So when we complain, it just like goes down and so maybe, you know, we want to keep like at least a steady, a good graph going. This is what Santa Teresa said, um, dealing with the uh, the challenges. 1933, he said, like the night of La Mancha. No, that, that's uh, Don Quixote, right? Which was a famous, as you know, uh, what 16th century uh, novel by uh, Cervantes. Like the night of La Mancha referring to the peasants, they see giants where there are nothing but windmills. They become ill-humored, sour people, full of bitter jealousy, rough-mannered, finding no good in anyone, looking on the black side of everything, those who are afraid of the rightful freedom of man those who do not know how to smile. And I know with the mask these days, uh, you know, maybe we have to all paint a smile on our, on our masks, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, those, are, those are good uh, indicators. Of course, complaints, ill-humored, sour, bitter jealousy, rough manner, right? Uh, finding no good in anyone, 
We don't find any good in anyone. We don't find any good in anyone. And we don't see the positive side. Look at the black side of everything. Uh, and, and, and those who are afraid of the rightful freedom of man or rightful freedom of others. And so this is ultimately a, a virtue that serves to support uh, our charity, uh, that, that is optimism. And there are many occasions for that in our life. And, uh, and optimism always comes with a solid uh, dose of a positive vision of life, a positive vision of the school. And it just really helps others to just get on with it. You know? Just let's get on with it. And, uh, uh, and we all have to face difficulties. Every Christian gentleman, every Christian lady, we have to set, you know, we have the setbacks, but we just have to, our founder, our founder used to say, just shrug your shoulders and get on with it, right? Shrug your shoulders. You know, he used to go, uh, where, you know? And so I remember there was that famous get together, I think it was in Argentina, and uh, this lady was asked the question, and she was like in a wheelchair and or something like that, and she said, I have this problem, I have that problem, I have this other problem, I have this. You know, like, how do I deal with this? He goes, paciencia, like, patience, like, you know. And uh, he said, yeah, but I have this problem. He goes, wait, what can I tell you? Patience, you know, be patient. And, and he, with that expression, uh, I think it's encogimiento de los hombros, which means, like, shrugging up the shoulders. Like, shrugging your shoulders in English sounds like we don't care. But it's just like, I do care, but what can you do? Be patient, right? So, um, so deep down, everybody wants to have, obviously, a joyful soul, and I know you want one too, and uh, everybody appreciates having, uh, everybody appreciates having a microphone that works. We all appreciate if you have a microphone that works. We'll get the batteries. We'll get all its batteries? Okay. So I didn't turn it off or something? It's okay. Everybody Oh, this is the wire. So, as I was saying, everybody appreciates having smiling faces around us. They're kind of like the batteries that we need, you know, the Duracell batteries. The Duracell batteries are really the smiling faces around us. And then we, in turn, have to have that smiling face. Right? And so, uh, and so uh, deep down, we all want this, and this is as appreciated, that is, a smiling face, as appreciated as a glass of water uh, in the desert. It just gives us, you know, optimism. So that the pessimist sees everything as dark and bad and negative, and it often is actually the, it's not just a, a bad thing, I mean, it's often the product of pride. And it, pessimism can cause great harm to those around us, certainly to your family, uh, to your children, right? When, when you think about when you think about your um, when you think about just like one picture of your childhood, just one picture, just like boom, like a freeze frame, right? Something there, right? That you remember that that is just there, right? Uh, and trying to see most, I would say most most of us we remember some act of kindness, some act of warmth, right? Some embrace, right? Uh, that, that we don't even remember why or what we did to deserve that, right? Uh, and, uh, and if that picture that we had was somehow something dark and negative and bad, that means we have to change the slide. We have to, we have to say, you know what, that doesn't define me. That doesn't define me. And, and, uh, and look, look, and then make that, go back to that good image, right? Uh, this guy, this guy I was telling you about, Andy Grammer, recounts how he, when he was a little kid, he loved to see magic, he loved to see like circus performance and stuff like that, and he told his mom how he loved the, this guy, I don't know if it was on TV or at the circus or something, who was a jungler, he was a jungler, and uh, he just kind of mentioned it in passing, and the next morning, he found, I don't know, in his desk or in his room, Handcrafted juggling pins. Handcrafted juggling pins, which she went out to get for him. He hadn't asked for them, she just gave them to him. And he started uh, learning 
in the garden, in the, in the yard, how to juggle. And he, he learned how to juggle. It took him a little while, it took him for hours, in fact, before he figured it out, right? And, and he said, that, bang, that was the best memory he has of his childhood, when his mom gave him uh, those juggling pins. Right? And then later on in life, he would go, uh, he decided, for example, to go to, um, to Skid Row, I guess that's in Los Angeles, some place where, where he would go, and with a group that he founded, he would go to makeovers to people in, in Skid Row and give them uh, you know, hair cleaning and stuff like that, things that they really needed. Right, and out of empathy and out of desire to help, and he, and he said that he attributed it to that moment, right? So, uh, of, of his mother. So, so let us uh, see how uh, we can also um, have that cheerfulness, that optimism. That's what uh, Pope Benedict says that in the infancy narratives, right? And there's a reason, after all, why uh, Christian piety is called. The joyful mysteries, the infancy the narratives, right? The earth, you know, the birth and all that. So, so we too can bring that about and um, and ask uh, that for our grace, but but work on it, knowing that uh, if we are habitually pessimistic, or even if we are just once pessimistic or negative, it can be the result of the fact that we have not well assimilated a failure of some kind. Uh, that there has been some kind of failure, some kind of bad thing, and we haven't integrated it into our life. We have not, we have decided in some way not to learn from it, not to grow from it, right? not to increase, not to allow our, remember we said the definition of optimism, right, is that whatever happens to you okay, leads you to be a better version of your, yourself, right? And uh, if we have a negative thing, that too can lead you to be a better version of yourself. And if, but if we haven't assimilated it, I haven't accepted it or offered it to God, it'll, yeah, it will do us worse. So, to, so um, and this is not because uh, optimism is simply the result of, um, of temperament and so forth, right? And we know Pope uh, Francis has given a, a series of, of lists of the secrets of happiness, but I just leave that to you to look up, so you can look it up. Pope Francis's Pope Francis reveals ten secrets to happiness, and uh, and it's interesting how when I Google that, the only not the only but most of the places that picked that up were secular media, secular media, and then way down it was like a Catholic news service, whatever. Oh, by the way, you know, but but it was interesting that that there was an interest among secular media to talk about the sources of happiness. You know, to live and let live, uh, to give yourself to others, to proceed with calm, and so forth. So, well, we can ask uh, this uh, grace of optimism. I don't want to keep you too long because we have an ask now. But, um, but again, the, the, the fundamental structural definition is that we have to be very honest with ourselves in order to be optimistic and upbeat, uh, sort of bouncy people. That is, we have to be grounded in optimism, which is the genuine belief that anything can make us better, and not only make us better, but can make us in the service of others. So that if we can be like bouncy balls, like those, you know those super balls that used to bounce, you know, that they, they bounce back in front of everything. And right now, well, God is asking us to bounce back from uh, this moment of pandemic, and, uh, and uh, we'll be amazed at what kind of changes he can bring about. That's, that's basically what I had, I didn't want to keep you too long, so. All right, okay, so. Okay, okay I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can be. not catch the musician's name. Andy, okay. Andy Grammer, yeah, Andy Grammer, yeah. I don't know him very well, but he, he produces little jingles, and uh, so what he does is he goes to groups like, like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and people like that, like, like people who have suffered, and he gets them to tell some story about their life, and he, like, some suffering that they've undergone, uh, like, 
like he went one time and he, and he met a couple that had lost a, a son, a little baby, I think it was, and how after that, I mean, they went through a very dark period, and then after that, they started getting calls from other people who had lost their children at the hospital. And they became like empathy counselors, like they, not empathy counselors is not the right word, but they, they had such, developed such empathy that they were able to counsel others in very hard times, right? And, uh, and so using that story that he had heard, he, he, he wrote a piece of music, and to him, to give joy to people, you know, with, with music was, uh, you know, was the, well, the joy of his life, and he, uh, he was a good uh, musician, and he, he did it, he persevered, because he used to go for an entire day, like 11 hours as a street musician, he would set up, it would take a long time to set up, and whatever he did with the guitar, and he would go the whole 11 hours, and he put on this thing, he did a single contribution, nobody gave him money, and he persevered, he eventually, uh, he goes,